Hi, I'm Pam, and this is my monthly update video letting you know everything that I was up to in the month of October. So at the beginning of October, I was kind of feeling like I couldn't get into any video games other than the things that I was playing co-op. I was just finding I was bouncing off everything single player I was playing. But luckily, near the end of the month, that kind of stopped happening and I have been able to finish things. Plus I had some things on stream and some co-op games that I played. But other than that, I went to the Toronto Game Expo near the end of October. Um, I was actually a guest there. This is a one day convention in Toronto down by the exhibition center. There's a big vendor floor. Um, there's some panels, there's cosplayers, there's tournaments, there's free plays, um, arcade machines and consoles and things like that. It was a good time. It's run by the same people who do the Gary, the, the Barry game exchange, which I was at a few months ago. Um, I did do a panel with the other guests, Adam Korolik and Shane and Adam from Rerez. We talked about collecting, which was fun to do. I was mainly there to continue to try to sell my collection, and that was a bit of a mixed bag. I ended up selling less than I did at Barry, which I wasn't expecting. I was kind of expecting, you know, Toronto, more people sell more things. It didn't quite happen like that. Uh, my friend Miles was there with me to help me sell and uh, keep me company at the table, which was awesome. But yeah, for the, I think there was about two hours left in the show and I had only sold 14 things, which felt pretty discouraging, honestly. And then in the last couple hours, some more things sold, which made it feel a little bit more worthwhile as, in far, as far as going there to sell things. Uh, but yeah, it was still pretty fun. Walked around, saw a lot of people that I don't get to see too often. Um, Miles recorded all of this footage and edited it together. If you want to see more of him, you can go visit his channel, Trading Cards. But yeah, it was a decent show. I still have a fair amount of stuff left, and I'm not really sure what my plan is for selling the rest of it. Um, there's probably not another show that I know of until springtime. So whether I do that or ugh, venture into Facebook marketplace or something to try to sell some of the higher ticket items, I'm not sure. But yeah, that was the Toronto Game Expo, which was fun. There's probably gonna be another one of those in the spring too, I would guess. But uh, yeah, I have one pickup from October. Uh, it was my birthday at the beginning of the month and my friend Melissa got me a new video game vinyl. This is the Hollow Knight Piano Collections, which I think is the only Hollow Knight vinyl I didn't have. I've got two of them. I'm pretty sure there's just the three. Um, it's got a lovely little art book on the inside with just some nice, nice pictures of Hollow Nest. And it is a double set and the vinyl themselves are a beautiful red color. Um, I love Hollow Knight, as everyone knows, and this is great music and also just like a beautiful, a beautiful put together package. So I'm very excited to have this. All right, so now on to games. Despite saying I had trouble getting into anything, I did actually finish quite a number of games or at least try them um, in October. The first thing I finished was The Last Express, which was an adventure game that I was streaming over on Twitch on Sundays. Finished this one up in October. It's a really interesting game. I think it's 1997. I might be wrong on that. But it uses rotoscoped animation, and it's sort of an adventure game, but not your typical point and click. It's all time-based, so time is constantly running and you're on this train, you're supposed to have met your friend there, but you get on the train and you find he's been murdered. So the first thing you need to do is get rid of his body. And if you don't do that within about a minute, you get a game over. It's very easy to get a game over, but you can also re rewind time to whatever time you want um, to go back and try again. So uh, it, that's kind of cool, although there's no actual saving of the game yourself. So it's really interesting because there's just all these people on this train that's going through Europe. They're from all different countries. They're speaking different languages. And a lot of the game is just sort of overhearing their conversations or seeing when they've left their room. So then maybe you can go and investigate it. 
It's a really interesting game, though it definitely had some frustrations for me. The interface wasn't entirely intuitive. Uh, there are some combat sections in the game, which I can't say that I was a fan of. Basically just uh, timing when to dodge or throw a punch while you're in combat. The ending ended up being pretty frustrating because I found out that I had missed picking up an item um, a number of hours before in game time and uh, without that item I couldn't get the good ending so I wasn't going to go back so I just took my canon ending as the train blows up and I'm dead now which I'm fine with but it's a really interesting game that's The Last Express if you're into sort of uh, adventure game history and weird or unique games, it's one that is worth taking a look at. The next game I finished was also something I played on Twitch as a little palette cleanser for my adventure game Sundays. I played one thing in a single sitting and this is If on a Winter's Night for Travelers. This is actually a game that is free on Steam if you want to check it out. It is beautiful pixel art and you start off also on a train in this game, but there are a number of characters in this train car and they start sort of telling their stories because no one remembers how they got on the train. So they start telling the story of sort of the last thing they remember. And it goes through and it's, you know, very gothic and creepy. And, you know, it doesn't take long to realize what exactly is going on on this train, but it's very good writing. It looks great. Um, the puzzles make sense, they're not overly challenging, but they're still satisfying when you complete them. And it was a really fun game, took about two, maybe two and a half hours to complete the whole thing. And uh, yeah, it's free, so if you like point and click adventure games, then you should check that one out too. I played a game called Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion, and I think this is just leaving Game Pass, so sorry about that. Uh, it's kind of a top-down Zelda-like game. Oh, phone call. It's kind of a top-down Zelda-like game. You play Turnip Boy and at the beginning of the game you get a letter saying you've committed tax evasion and you rip up the letter. And that's a, a theme throughout the game. Anytime you find any kind of letter, any kind of paper with information on it, you tear it up. But you talk to the mayor, he's like an onion, and he gives you all of these quests to do. He's probably not on the up and up, but you just go around sort of talking to people, getting little side quests, doing some fairly simple combat and gaining new abilities as you go. Um, it was a very silly game. I enjoyed the writing. It was very humorous. The gameplay was pretty simple overall, which was kind of what I was looking for, something that I felt a little bit mindless that I didn't have to pay too much attention to. Uh, so it's not, you know, the most engaging game out there, but it was a cute one for, you know, the four or so hours that it lasted. A game I finished co-op recently is Riddled Corpses EX. Uh, this is a pixelated sort of twin stick shooter in sort of an overhead isometric view. It's got cute pixel art. You play one of a number of characters just sort of going through levels and shooting zombies and monsters and other kind of undead creatures. There is a little story to go along with it. I admit I did not pay attention to it at all, uh, but it was a really fun one to play co-op. Uh, just simple but satisfying gameplay. As you go, you collect coins, and then every time you die, you can go and use them to unlock new characters or level up the characters you do have or open new weapons. So that was interesting. So you just kept getting stronger as you went. There was only five levels in total, but it takes more than a few tries to get through every one. And you know, you need those upgrades to succeed, or at least we did. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. All the levels were pretty different. It was very challenging at times. And yeah, this was a pretty fun twin stick shooter. Much better than the last one we tried to co-op, which was Demon's Crystals, which is kind of the same idea, except it's got more, um, you know, current art. It's not, uh, not pixelated, but Demon's Crystals was just got kind of boring after a while. Um, there's not so much any kind of leveling system or currency system. It was mainly just 
You're in a graveyard and you're shooting things and occasionally picking up cards to upgrade your weapon, which uh, wears off after a little bit. But yeah, Demon's Crystals got pretty tired after maybe an hour. It was just the gameplay didn't really evolve much at all. But uh, Real of Corpses EX was very fun if you have couch co-op buddies to play with. Uh, it was really great. So the game that finally got me out of my solo gaming slump at the end of the month is Killer Frequency. And this is a game I really enjoyed that has a very novel concept. You play a small town uh, late night radio host and something happens. You're just in the studio with your producer who's in the other room sort of behind glass and the town's 911 operator calls you and lets you know that the sheriff is dead, the second cop in the town is uh, out on vacation, and the third one has been attacked and needs to go to the hospital. And there seems to be a serial killer, maybe a serial killer back from the 50s returning today. This takes place sort of in the 80s. And she's going to go get help and she's gonna hand over the 911 operation to you. So when people call the radio station, they might be calling to request a song or they might be calling because they're about to get murdered by a serial killer. So the game mostly just takes place in your DJ booth, which is quite spacious, honestly, but people call you and you have to solve their problems and get them out of trouble when they find themselves in the vicinity of this serial killer. So occasionally you leave and you need to find some information in order to help people and use it to sort of puzzle out the correct things to tell them over the phone. Everything takes place just over the phone. So you're hearing what's happening to them, but you're not actually seeing it. So for example, one of the first calls is a journalist and he's in his offices and the killer's in there with him and he faxes you a layout of the office and you have to figure out which phone to call to sort of lure the killer away and then to tell the person what office to go to to hide from the killer. So you need to do that in various iterations for a number of people that call you over the evening that you're radio DJing. And sometimes you save them, sometimes you don't if you make bad decisions. I saved almost everyone. I lost a few people, but it was just a really cool game. Um, sort of a little bit more on the comedic side, not terribly scary. There were, you know, a couple little spooky bits, one or two minor jump scares, but I just thought it was really well done. The voice acting was good. And yeah, just the whole concept and mechanics of it were so sort of fresh that it felt really great to play. I think the game was maybe, I don't know, six hours-ish, sort of. Um, I played it in just a couple of sittings because I was really into it and I really enjoyed it. So if you're looking for something a little different, then Killer Frequency was a lot of fun. The next one is something that I had been looking forward to since I played the demo at a Steam Next Fest a while ago, and it is Slay the Princess. This is a visual novel where you start out in a forest, a narrator is talking to you and tells you you need to go into this cabin and slay the princess that's in there or else the world will end. So you go into the cabin and you have choices. Do you want to pick up the knife on the table? Do you want to leave the knife behind? Do you want to just run in and stab her? Do you want to talk to her? Do you want to free her? And based on your decisions, her reactions are much different and she can become sort of a very different kind of princess. And this process sort of loops over with the situation changing every time based on how you reacted the first time. And it's just really well done. Uh, the voice acting is great. There's only two voice actors, but they do a phenomenal job because the princess has so many different iterations, all with different tones and voices. The narrator is also doing the hero's voice. So you have the voice of the hero, but sometimes you might have the voice of the stubborn or the contrarian or the romantic, and they all sound slightly different. And it was just had excellent writing. The art was really cool. And the whole um, sort of 
repeating idea of it changing every time just worked really well. I streamed a little bit of it and then I finished a playthrough on my own and then I started a second playthrough just because I wanted to see uh, what else could happen and uh, what other princesses I could end up running into. So yeah, Slay the Princess, if you like visual novels, especially sort of spooky ones, I uh, definitely recommend that. And the last game I finished just yesterday, I think, is Jusant, which is a the newest one from Don't Nod. It just came out on Game Pass. And this is a game about climbing. There's not a whole lot of story here. What story there is is told just from notes and things that you find, but you're just climbing this big giant tower and you're learning as you go that sort of the rains have gone away, the water is dried up and everyone has disappeared. So you figure what you're doing has something to do with that. You have a little creature with you who can help you with things, but oh, mostly you're just climbing. You're climbing up different rock faces. Um, you get different abilities eventually, so you can jump and double jump and um, make things sprout so you have new things to hold on to, slow certain creatures down and use them as handles and things like that. If I had to compare it to anything, it would be Shadow of the Colossus in terms of mechanics mostly, just like how you have to do your climbing. Um, sort of each hand is separately um, controlled. You have to manage your stamina. You don't want to run out of stamina or you won't be able to hold on anymore. Except unlike Shadow of the Colossus, you're not murdering everything in the game. It's very sort of relaxing and almost meditative. Some of the collectibles you're getting are shells and you just like listen to the shell and it's really nice. Uh, I found, especially as the game went on and the environments changed, the climbing mechanic was just really satisfying um, and fun to sort of puzzle out your route up to the next section of this big tower. And yeah, I overall really enjoyed it. That is Jusson, and it was maybe four or five hours long. And last, one thing that my Wednesday co-op group I think is retired. I don't know. We might go back and try it again once or twice. Who knows? But we were looking forward to Warhammer 40k Dark Tide because earlier in the year, was it this year? I think so. We played uh, Vermintide and we quite enjoyed Vermintide. It was a fun four player, you know, smashy magic rat game and we had fun with it. Uh, I thought that Dark Tide was going to be similar, just with guns instead of swords and staves. Uh, that wasn't the case. It seems like Dark Tide is more of a always online, community-driven, changing, procedurally generated objective levels kind of thing. Um, I would doubt it has an ending. It's just about sort of leveling up and doing kind of repetitive levels. First of all, we found it really difficult. Uh, we played, I don't know, maybe four or five levels, or we tried to, and we ended up dying right near the end of every single one of them. Uh, there would come a point where there was just a horde of enemies and we'd get mowed down and not be able to continue. Uh, but yeah, it was just not what we were looking for. We're looking for like a story campaign that you start and you end, and that's not at all what this was. Like, the guns and everything felt fine. Uh, everyone was just always talking Warhammer stuff, which I don't have much knowledge of. But yeah, it was disappointing that this wasn't more of like a, a co-op campaign and just seemed like one of those never-ending online match kind of games. So yeah, I, I don't think, even if we try it again, I don't think we're going to be spending too much time with uh, Dark Tide. All right, that is it for my October updates. Leave me a comment. Let me know if you've been playing anything good that you want to recommend. If you've gotten any interesting pickups lately. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.